We had such a lead on the rest of the world. We got fat, dumb, and happy. Over 12 million VCRs were imported. Our enemy is foreign competition. High technology is like an escalator. If your workforce doesn't understand the technology, then they're off the escalator. We can't make good cars. That's why we import We're cars. We're going to wind up the net importer of just about every major electronics product. The villain is the U.S. government. Congressional Budget Office. We can't make good scientists, so we import our scientists. We could learn from the Japanese. They learn our technology and mail us products that are better than the ones we, we can We have make. to educate a lot more engineers and scientists. American industry is the plaything of Wall Street. hundred. We're going to sell a hundred. They want their money in. Quick turn. Score is seven to three with the United States being at the three. We don't have a crisis. We have a disaster. Good evening. I'm Sander Van Oker. Our story tonight is about a nation that once controlled its own destiny, but a nation that is now losing the future. Our story tonight is about America. When I began in television 30 years ago, the nameplate on most studio television cameras was an American name, RCA. Today, the names are Ikigami, Panasonic, Hitachi, and Sony, all of them Japanese. Japan used to be known as an imitator of goods made elsewhere, primarily in the U.S. But today, the imitators have become the innovators. Japan, Germany, Korea, all challenging America. How did the roles get reversed? There's plenty of blame to go around. Our educators, our industries, and our government. Tonight, we'll look at how the nation which once held the future in the palm of its hand is letting the future slip through its fingertips. We begin with what looked like the dawn of a new American era. Alamogordo, New Mexico, July 16, 1945. Dramatic testimony of American technology. Three, two, one. The atomic bomb, infinitely more destructive than any existing weapon a development of the best and brightest minds in the country. Throughout the United States, the 1940s was a time of innovation and application. For American scientists, it was one breakthrough after another. Synthetic rubber, advances in jet aircraft, and digital computers. Americans developed the Polaroid camera. Thank you. Something very pretty to show you in just a minute. And the transistor that revolutionized the whole communications industry. It was American know-how that designed reflecting telescopes and long-playing records and so much more. Hear that tone. It's RCA Victor. Reach for the Remington. It always keeps itself frost-free. When it came to technology, the United States was the undisputed leader. There was simply no comparison and no competition. This can happen only in America, where we have a competitive enterprise system in which nothing is impossible. <laughs> The United States emerged from the Second World War as the only country with its industrial base stronger than ever. Germany and Japan had been pulverized. France devastated. Britain was economically shattered. In what would become exquisite irony, America paid to rebuild those industrialized countries. While they rebuilt, we were on a roll. So much so that by the 1950s, this country was producing more than half the cars bought around the world. It even affected how we saw the world as RCA brought out the first color television sets. The wonderful world of color. The first artificial Earth satellite in the world has now been created. When the Russians put the first satellite in space, Americans responded to the challenge. By 1969, had enough of the right stuff to put the first man on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. American technology was still supreme, still secure, or so it seemed. We had such a lead on the rest of the world, on a whole set of dimensions, science dimensions, economic dimensions, education dimensions, that in some sense we got fat, dumb, and happy uh, behind that huge lead. The rest of the world was desperate to catch up. And it did. West Germany came back quickly and competitively in key industries like automobiles. It was called the West German miracle. And then there was Japan. At first, the Japanese were content simply to copy American technology, turning out cheap imitations. Gradually, however, they improvised and improved on American products. It started with radios and wristwatches, and it spread. It's a Sony. She's got a Sony Trinitron. It's not just a color television. It's a Sony. There is no one point where U.S. technology began losing its edge. 
Through the 1960s and 70s, it was a slow, gradual process. So gradual, in fact, many Americans failed to notice. It was only in the mid-70s, when our annual trade deficit began soaring into the tens of billions of dollars, did we begin to understand. Did we begin to see just how many products were coming into this country, from Germany and Taiwan, Korea and Japan, and how much the demand for American products was drying up overseas. It is reflected in many sectors of the economy, in all parts of the country. In automobiles, the United States share of the world market has fallen from 76% to 24%. In machine tools, from 100% to 35%. In turntables, from 90% to 1%. In color televisions, from 90% to 10%. Not long ago, 27 American companies made color TVs. Today, there is only one major manufacturer, Zenith. The others may have American names, but they are foreign made or foreign owned. Even RCA TV, a pioneer in color television, has been sold to a French company. Fewer new processes get invented in America and therefore we get pushed back into lower productivity, lower wage industries, while those countries that are better scientifically capture larger market shares in the high tech, high productivity, high wage industries. Aware of what's at stake for the American economy today and into the future, Many see this technological competition as a kind of war, a war the United States stands to lose, indeed is losing, one battle after another, one industry after another. And let's not forget this. Cheaper labor drew American investment and American technology overseas. In effect, we exported jobs and our technology went with it. What we got in exchange were less expensive and eventually better products stamped made in Japan, Germany, Korea, or Taiwan. That was the start, but there were other factors. American education, American industry, American government were all to blame for losing the future. It's called Sputnik. How in the hell did they ever get ahead of us? Russia had won the opening round in rocket supremacy. When we were beaten into space by our arch rivals in October 1957, it was a blow to our national pride. This generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. That was more like it. We would shoot for the moon. Straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and fly right. The whole nation took up the challenge, starting with our school children. High marks in math and science became a matter of national priority. Federal funds were poured into improving the science equipment and instruction in our schools. Science fairs discovered future Einsteins, and we watched Mr. Wizard. That's what all the kids in the neighborhood call him because he shows them the magic and mystery of science in everyday living. It all paid off. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. By 1969, back where we belonged, on top of the world, we slapped each other on the back and waited for the rest of the world to catch us if it could. Fly right. And then it fell apart again. The United States became mired in Vietnam. Our high school and college students became less concerned with being rocket scientists than with staying out of the draft. Our school systems began putting less emphasis on math and science. Education, the key to technological superiority. Today, our nation's schools continue to fail the test. Don't know much about geometry. Math, you need that too, to know how to count your money. Don't know much about I don't really like science that much. Don't know much about science books. It's really boring and people go to sleep and... Oh, no, much about nothing at all. The first problem is poor teacher training. It starts in grade school, where many American children are introduced to science and math by teachers who haven't received much training in those subjects. They naturally do not do a very good job across the country of teaching science, and they turn those kids off. Michelle. And the color pictures in this book are made by using inks in the three basic colors of red, blue, and yellow plus black. See figure 4 through 28. In Pontiac, Michigan, this junior high school science course is taught by an art teacher, 
it is not uncommon. Most science graduates today are drawn by the greater respect and larger salaries offered by industry. The resulting shortage of qualified teachers is a principal reason why sports coaches and other non-specialists are teaching math and science. My science background is poor, and therefore I don't feel that I can give the kid all that he or she needs in the science area. I'm an artist, and that's where my heart is, in art. If I teach them art, I am a teacher. According to the National Science Teachers Association, one-third of the nation's science classes are being taught by misassigned teachers. I've had coaches and, and, and some of the not-so-good teachers, and therefore I've got a weak math background. And you always expect that you know, your science teacher is supposed to be a science teacher, you know, not a volleyball coach. Poorly trained teachers. And curriculum yeah, is a problem, time. too. Yeah, you're Educators good. agree that hands-on experimentation is an invaluable tool in turning kids on to the wonders of science. Ew, check out all this stuff moving around. The and the plants. But this outing in Chicago is the exception. Nationally, more than 80% of 7th and 11th graders never take field trips. 50% don't have access to a lab. Science equipment costs a lot of money. The budget that I have to work with as science department head has been around $800. Now that's for the entire school of about 600 children. What you learn too often depends on where you live. The entire school district in Pontiac, Michigan is so financially pressed that it can't afford any kind of science course for its ninth grade students. Right next door in affluent Bloomfield Hills, the kids aren't lacking science instruction or equipment in this state-of-the-art lab. So curriculum is a problem in the United States, but not for our international competitors. We shortened the school year and allowed students to drop difficult math and science courses. Japan, meanwhile, adopted our once world-class education system, upped the intensity, and used it to launch an impressive economic assault. They turn out a uniformly well-educated workforce. We have some young people that are obviously as good as any in the world, and then we have a bottom tail that in the rest of the industrial world just doesn't exist in terms of low performance. So our international competitors are motivated, but most American students are turned off to science. The reasons are social and cultural. A girl who's always working at the lab on a science project, obviously you're not going to um, pick up a lot of dates that way. They want instant solutions. Uh, if given a problem, they want to solve it immediately, or it's certainly not worth doing. They probably perceive science as not as glamorous as it probably was in, in the early stages of the um, space development. Negative 21, negative 1. What does it all add up to? Nothing good. In an international study of student science achievement in 17 countries, America's brightest 17-year-olds taking advanced biology courses ranked dead last. Another report placed us close to the bottom in math, just ahead of Swaziland. Many children aren't learning what they need to know. It's cold, it's freezing. The most disadvantaged are doing the worst. Despite recent gains, black and Hispanic youngsters remain at least four years behind their white peers. New York, New York, all cheese. In the past few years, America's most recent immigrants have been the bright lights of science competitions. But studies show that by their third generation in the U.S., they've been assimilated, pulled down to the same poor level of science and math achievement as the rest of the student population. Turned off in high school turned off in higher education, even at Harvard. Professor Sheldon Glashow, a Nobel Prize winner in physics, calls most of his students scientific illiterates. There's a sort of arrogant pride in not knowing physics that I see. These guys and girls don't want to understand the world about us. They look at the stars, and the stars are nice, but they'd rather watch television. The lack of enthusiasm for science has not affected the size of the student body here at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. But most of the engineers receiving their graduate degrees from this great American institution are not Americans. In fact, last year, 60% of the graduate engineering degrees awarded in the United States went to students from foreign countries.
we import them. We import them from Iran, we import them from Turkey, from Taiwan, from whatever countries we can find. They stay in this country, more than half of them stay in this country. They take all the good jobs. And I'm not attacking this, this is, this is not a problem. This is the solution. These new Americans who are a vital part of America today and are the technological backbone of the country are the solution. Our people can't hack it. After graduation, many foreign students stay on as faculty members and lab assistants at MIT. But while Japan sends thousands of young engineers to train here, most of them return home. They come here, they learn our technology, and then they fly back home and mail us products that are better than the ones we can make with the same technology. That's what they do. Sheldon Glashow has watched as America's lead has slipped away. My father, who immigrated to this country many years ago from, from Russia, uh, saw Haley's Comet as a youth. And he told me that he wouldn't be alive when it came back, but he knew that the Americans were going to send a spaceship up into space and find out exactly what Halley's Comet was made of. Sadly, he died before the comet came back. What happened when Halley's Comet went up is indeed spaceships were sent up to study its properties. There was a Russian spaceship, there was a Japanese spaceship, there was a French spaceship, there was an Italian spaceship, but there weren't no American spaceships. We gave up the torch. Don't know much about geometry. Don't know much trigonometry. Don't know much about algebra. We no longer can afford the luxury of having a, a whole population of youngsters who want to be baseball players or rock musicians. We want them and need them to become the Edisons of the next generation, or that next century will not be ours. It will be Japan's. So our schools are not giving future workers what they need. An industry is being forced to step in simply to survive. In Burlington, Vermont, for example, IBM is teaching its entire workforce of 8,000 people, Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, which they should have mastered in high school. If IBM has to teach Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, then the price of IBM semiconductor chips has to include the cost of teaching Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. If Hitachi makes the same chips and they don't have to teach Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 because the kids have already learned it in high school, then Hitachi chips are cheaper than IBM chips and IBM goes out of business. According to some estimates, American industry is spending more than $20 billion a year to educate and retrain its workers. Does that mean that the captains of industry are picking up the battle flag our educators dropped? Not quite. American industry itself shares the blame for losing the future. Last year, three Japanese companies, Canon, Hitachi, and Toshiba, were awarded more U.S. patents than any American firm. True, Americans still win more Nobel Prizes in science and math than anyone else. But American business is losing the race to translate success in the laboratories to success in the marketplace. Just this week, we learned the U.S. is trailing Japan in X-ray lithography, a dramatic new way to manufacture semiconductors. From semiconductors to sewing machines, microchips to mobile phones, American business has failed to capitalize on good ideas. The Sony Walkman. The world hasn't been the same. From the people who brought you big screen television comes the sound to go. Introducing Video Walkman from Sony. German engineering, the Volkswagen way. The best sedan in the world. Problem number one, playing it safe. We don't take risks. Sometimes good ideas just slip through our fingers. Take the compact disc. Companies like Philips, the Dutch electronics maker, thought it was a good idea. American industry thought the idea was risky. They were not interested in compact discs uh, because that uh, would not be successful. Uh, the black disc was there and would stay forever. <laughs> The black disc, of course, is the record album. It's now an endangered species, while compact disc sales topped $1 billion for the first six months of this year. But the money involved in CDs is just a drop in the bucket compared to another technology we gave away. Video cassette recorders. The first video recorders were developed in the U.S. by the same company that made audio tape recorders, Ampex. 
But in the 60s, Ampex didn't recognize the potential of the consumer market for video products. Japan did. Ampex was not particularly concerned at that time, so they ignored the Japanese efforts. When Ampex finally decided to go after the competition, it was too little, too late. Faced with $40 million in losses, it sold its technology to Toshiba and dropped the project. Other American companies had VCRs in development, but they didn't make it to the stores. It's a consumer market which now sees VCRs in two-thirds of American homes. Last year, over 12 million VCRs were imported into the United States. Not a single one was produced domestically. We lost the entire game. And what about the loss of even newer technology? Listen to the story of the Colorox Corporation. They developed a new color laser copier machine. We have an outstanding new technology that will create machines that are half the cost of existing machines. It will operate 50% faster, turn out consistently better quality output, and the copy cost is half the copy cost, all costs included the competitive machines. Colorox had one problem. They couldn't get any American investors to back them. No one would take the risk. They want their money in and they want to bring it out. They want you to go public. Quick turnarounds. The product we're dealing with was a three, four year cycle. You don't get in and out quick. Turned away at Wall Street, Colorox turned to Japan. The Colorox technology is now heading for the marketplace in a machine from Sharp, made in Japan. Wall Street greed, another problem. In the past few years, Wall Street has become preoccupied with something else. Buy 100, going to sell 100, Volvo. So buying 500, Sam Victor Boy for the day at 7 8. And look for even more money to be made from the IJR Nabisco buyout. I urge you, as a part of your mission, seek wealth. Merge Romania, paying huge sums to buy existing companies instead of investing in the company's futures. 20 years ago, Wall Street was the handmaiden of American industry. American industry needed money, you go to Wall Street. These days, American industry is the plaything of Wall Street. The roles have been reversed. Wall Street has gone out of control. We're on a, a binge. It's a casino. It's that casino atmosphere that contributes to the stifling of American technology. Good inventions need money and time to grow, but these days, Wall Street's time frame is the quarterly report. Every three months, the bottom line must show results. We have created a, a monster here that is pressing the management of this, uh, uh, this economic system to do things that if society had to vote, it wouldn't vote for us to do that. Problem number three, research and development. This, an R&D lab, is one thing most experts would like to keep. These labs are where companies get most of their ideas and where they turn those ideas into new technology. But corporate concerns over buying out other companies or fighting off companies that want to take them over are taking their toll on research. Example, Borg Warner Company, which did research in several crucial areas, offshore oil production and transportation, among others, spent $2 billion fighting a takeover battle. After that, their debt was too high. The research lab was the first to go. It was an outstanding laboratory. I doubt that we'll ever see its kind again. Ah! I saw color TV, RCA Victor color TV. Compatible color TV was born at the David Sarnoff Research Center in New Jersey. Gosh, the color is true. Her hair so red, her eyes so blue. But General Electric decided it didn't need the facility when it took over RCA, so the lab was sold. In the process, its staff cut by 300, its budget by 20%. I would say in terms of doing more basic research, we do less now than we did 20 years ago, certainly. Losing know-how. We are the nation that invented mass production, but we've lost our leadership in the very technology of manufacturing. To put it more bluntly, we don't know how to make things anymore. Take microchips, the devices used to store information in computers. The microchip was co-developed by an American, Dr. Robert Noyce. We spent more and more of our time advancing the technology. The Japanese spent more and more of their effort in developing the manufacturing techniques to make these things cheap. Result, though we're ahead in advanced computers, we've been all but forced out of the market in memory chips, which are used in everything from cars to copiers. Another example, robotics. The use of machines to do what used to be man's work, like painting and welding cars. We developed much of this technology, but it was Japan that applied it. The worst plants in the U.S. are 
really pretty bad. A lot of plants in the U.S. are still operating on the assumption that there has to be a trade-off between productivity and quality. The Japanese have shown us that there doesn't have to be. The name is Dodge. The quality is Chrysler. The auto industry knows it has a problem when it comes to production technology. And while there have been some improvements on the factory floor, many critics say the real problem is at the top. And when something goes wrong, they try to fix the blame, not the process. Because, in fact, they don't know how the work gets done. And right now, no one is fixing it. Managers are more interested in profits, not products. And profits don't produce new ideas. It's a problem from top to bottom. High technology is like an escalator. If you have a workforce that's capable of understanding the present generation of technology, they can go on and adapt and to the next generation of technology. But if your workforce doesn't understand the technology, can't apply the technology, can't develop new products with that technology, then they're off the escalator. Then you can't get back on. Think of what you've just seen, the loss of one promising product and technology after another. You'd think our business community would have learned by now, but it hasn't. In fact, we're about to lose another new product and a technology with extraordinary applications. We're talking about high-definition television, HD TV. You may not be able to appreciate just how sharp the HD TV picture will be as you watch tonight on your set. But experts agree, HDTV will revolutionize TV viewing. Given the stakes, it's hard to imagine why American business has been so slow to react to the creation of high-definition television. By the late 1990s, just 10 years from now, the world market for this new, vastly improved television is expected to be $30 billion a year. $30 billion. And unless American business shapes up fast, that market won't be ours. But U.S. industry is blowing it again. For every dollar that it has spent on HDTV, the Japanese have invested 10. And our business community has given little support to people like Dr. William Glenn, an inventor, trying to create an American version of HDTV. The William Glenns of the world, uh, the latter-day equivalents of the Tom Edisons and the Alexander Graham Bells, uh, they're in their labs, they're doing their work, uh, but without the kind of additional support, all of their genius alone cannot carry us uh, to success. Once again, business failure to invest in the future and to take risks could have enormous consequences. Because when it comes to HD TV, we might not only lose that huge market for new improved television, but we could lose a whole new family of technology as well. The fact is, microchips developed for HDTV will have extraordinary applications. Medical applications, for example. We may be able to detect diseases like cancer earlier and treat them more effectively because the imaging done during medical testing will be so much sharper. Defense applications. Fighter pilots could be able to see through clouds, getting clear shots at their targets, no matter what the weather conditions. Transportation applications, smart cars with computer navigation systems would be able to respond to our verbal commands and take us where we want to go, communicating all the time with smart highways, which will warn them of traffic congestion. And what will the economic cost be if American business doesn't take stock and if we lose out on HDTV? Experts say our competitiveness in other areas of consumer electronics would be hurt as well. The best estimates are that our share of the personal computer and semiconductor markets would be cut in half in the next 20 years. That's a pretty heavy price to pay. American business losing the future. It is the federal government which must take the blame for failing to provide coordination and financial incentives to fight for the nation's technology future, which many say is our real national security. We might start by looking for the one agency responsible for coordinating our technology policy, if only there was one. Good afternoon, what else I am, service? Congressional Budget Office. Commerce Department. Center for Aviation. It's a confusing picture. 
The U.S. government has no coordinated strategy for technology. Funding and policy are scattered among 14 executive branch departments, dozens of executive branch agencies and offices, nine congressional committees, and four congressional support agencies. The government's ad hoc, disjointed approach to technology has hampered this nation's ability to compete technologically. The villain is the U.S. government, which has fecklessly assumed that the United States would always be number one in technology, uh, essentially because it always had been. But we're living in a changing world. Before World War I, it didn't matter if the government had no technology policy. In fact, it could be argued that leaving business to business fostered innovation, like Henry Ford's assembly line that revolutionized the manufacturing process. But in the early years of this century, some industrialists had become too powerful. Men like John D. Rockefeller with his Standard Oil Trust. So, the government stepped in. Teddy Roosevelt became a national hero enforcing antitrust laws which were intended to protect small companies and to ensure fair competition in our domestic market, the only market we cared about back then. When it comes to doing business worldwide, you gotta think in global proportions. But now we live and work in a global market. Antitrust laws make it difficult for companies to pool resources in order to compete in that global arena. By contrast, foreign governments encourage companies to pool their resources. We should permit a lot more cooperative behavior amongst our high technology firms. And in some ways, I think that would substitute and make up for the fact that the government can't seem to coordinate its policies. And there are economic obstacles confronting U.S. industries, muddled tax laws and fiscal policies which discourage long-term investment, and as we've seen earlier in this broadcast, encourage merger mania. Even if a company wants to focus on the long term, tax laws often operate against it. Tax credits for research and development are renewed only on a short-term basis. That fosters uncertainty and makes companies less willing to invest in what is inherently a long-term process. Another major handicap to long-term investment is the $148 billion federal budget deficit. The budget deficit is the devil's recipe for a low-saving society, and that means a low-investing society, and that means that new technology will have less of a chance to uh, develop. Technology piracy. It's a risk companies run when they do develop new products and techniques. An example, Corning Glass spent 20 years and more than $200 million researching and developing optical fiber, a key component in telecommunications. Corning licensed that technology to Japan's Sumitomo Electric for sales in Japan, not in the U.S., but Sumitomo made sales in the U.S. anyway, infringing Corning's patents. Corning sued, only to learn that there were no clearly established legal protections against foreign technology piracy. As a result, it took several years and millions of dollars in legal fees before Corning managed to secure its patents. We're losing between 40 and 60 billion dollars a year because we don't enforce, and other governments don't enforce, our property rights. There is also the question of defense technology, which currently absorbs the lion's share of the government's research and development effort. It has been key to maintaining our security in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Once the technology coming out of the Cold War was a boon to private industry, the same technology that produced the B-52 bomber brought us the Boeing 707, the passenger jet which transformed world travel. But today, commercial payoff for military technology, like the stealth bomber, is not what it was in the 50s and 60s. The reason? The products being engineered are so finely tuned to the military environment that they're quite exotic objects. They're not uh, very similar to the kinds of things that we use in everyday life. An example is the enormous research effort underway for President Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative, the most exotic defense research and development program in the nation's history. 
when it comes to something like a, a neutral particle beam to attack boosters or warheads in space, it's a little hard to see what you're going to do with an object like that for commercial purposes. Two-thirds of all federal research and development money goes to defense programs. Overall, we're spending a lot more for defense than our allies. Japan spends about 1% of its gross national product on defense, West Germany 3%, while we spend more than 6% of ours. That leaves Japan and Germany with more resources for commercial development. It's been a blessing to them that they have not had to carry the umbrella of the Cold War, uh, that uh, the U.S. Uh, has been uh, patrolling their shores. And no policy coordination handicaps U.S. technology. By contrast, our chief competitors have coherent national technology policies centered in civilian agencies. In Japan, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, MITI, plays a major role in targeting, coordinating, and funding Japanese efforts in high technology. The Japanese believe that it is the duty of the government to assure a leading position internationally in key industries. That's the way it works in Japan. It can't work, it can never work exactly that way in the United States. But using our own institutions, uh, I believe that we can do more to provide the kind of favorable, supportive environment that's needed. The Pentagon is the one institution now able to provide that support. We're the ones that have the biggest impact in the marketplace because we spend more money than anybody else does. That marketplace the resource, the industrial base is critical to us. This is why Semitech was created. The it's Pentagon recently stepped in with $500 million in support for Semitech, a consortium of U.S. microchip manufacturers. The idea? Defense and industry would share the cost of putting ailing U.S. chip makers back on the fast track. In return, the Pentagon would become less dependent on foreign chip makers. While the Pentagon has taken center stage, critics say there is a better alternative. We have an Office of the Science, Advisor, Science and Technology Advisor to the President. That office is charged with the coordination of uh, technology and science policy throughout the executive branch. The trouble is it just hasn't worked. In fact, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy has a meager $1.8 million budget, less than half what it was a decade ago. And the office depends on borrowing personnel from other departments. The current science advisor does not even have direct access to the president. Even though President-elect George Bush has said he'll appoint a science advisor he'll listen to, it's going to take more than one advisor to unscramble the alphabet soup that makes up our technology policy. And unless Mr. Bush can forge such a policy, we will continue to slip behind in technology. Government losing the future. Biotechnology presents to us opportunities that are so great we can't conceive what those benefits will be. Cows in experimental programs produce 10 to 15 percent more milk. Genetic engineering is going to allow us to take plant breeding to a new level. The future for lasers is wide open and I probably can't even imagine the applications. What can it do for you? Absolutely everything. Welding, cutting, heat treating. We'd like to uh, announce to you today a breakthrough in the use of lasers for the treatment of urinary stones. The range of supercomputer applications are exploding. For all the sorts of things you use computers for, supercomputers tend to do them better. I don't think they'll ever develop a machine that, that we'll say is too fast. What you've just seen is a glimpse of some of the new technologies which will shape the future, the way we live well into the 21st century. The question is how much of this new world will be built by us not just bought by us. One major new technology is under development that could bring about a host of new miracles. It's called superconductivity. And it's one arena where the U.S. has a chance to reverse the recent trend of lost opportunities. This disk is floating in midair because of a phenomenon known as superconductivity. The flow of electrical energy from a magnet below keeps it up there. And because of the unique molecular structure of the disk, virtually no energy is lost. The disk could theoretically hang up there forever. The principles involved in this laboratory experiment have vast practical applications. 
this prototype train, for instance, is hovering above its rails with the help of superconducting materials. The result, no friction. The train rides along on a magnetic cushion, reaching tremendous speeds, more than 300 miles an hour, twice as fast as the fastest trains go now. And another application, superconducting material stretched into a wire could transmit electricity with far greater efficiency. Electricity could travel vast distances without ever losing power. The result, more plentiful and cheaper energy. The story of superconductivity reveals that the U.S. was once positioned to lead the field in research and development, but may have dropped the ball. In 1986, two scientists from an American company, IBM, discovered a higher temperature superconducting material. They found it in an unexpected substance, ceramic. Until then, superconductors had to be cooled to a temperature of about 450 degrees below zero in order to perform properly. But ceramic worked at a higher temperature and therefore could have much wider application. The IBM scientists won the Nobel Prize and touched off a worldwide race for the holy grail of physics a superconductor that would work at room temperature, and that could lead to even more practical, everyday uses. It would truly revolutionize major, major uh, industries such as transportation, communication, health, uh, and certainly energy. The possible benefits could be 10 or 20 years away, but the winner of the high temperature superconductor race will be the country that can capitalize on the scientific discoveries and become the first to translate them into marketable products. One country is uniquely poised to do just that, but it is not the United States. The Japanese look at superconductivity as the possible start of, of competition for the 21st century. First, government. Consider the U.S. and Japanese responses to the IBM discovery. Within weeks, Japan's Ministry of International Trade and Industry, MITI, began forming a superconductivity consortium. Forty-five Japanese companies were quickly enlisted and supplied more than 50 scientists to work full-time. But it was nearly eight months later before the U.S. announced its plans. And even then, it was a lot of show but little substance. President Reagan's superconductivity initiative called for advisory panels, patent protection, loosening of antitrust laws, and the establishment of superconductivity research centers. But it did not address the key area of new funding for research and development. And more than a full year later, Congress passed the Superconductivity and Competitiveness Act. It called for a five-year plan for research and development, but again authorized no new money. A lot of these acts are band-aids expressly focused towards superconductivity. And a recent report by the U.S. Office of Technology Assessment concludes that U.S. policies remain in a state of considerable disarray. Why? Too many cooks in the kitchen. Uh, Congress is in there, various people out of the administration, and it's very difficult for anybody, any one group or agency or individual to get on and do what they know they need to do. So while the U.S. has wasted a lot of time, the Japanese are pushing ahead toward a coherent national policy in high temperature superconductivity. As for education, Japan tripled university research funding of superconductivity from 1987 to 1988. It also has the largest research budget of any arm of the Japanese government. In the U.S., University research is getting a shrinking portion of existing federal funding for high temperature superconductivity. 15% this year, 13% next year. Students with degrees in material science, particularly ceramics, will be the future scientists who can translate lab discoveries into commercial superconductor products. U.S. engineering schools granted 3,700 PhDs in 1986, only 14 we're in ceramics. We have to educate a lot more uh, engineers and scientists, and especially engineers that understand this technology implementation. And our university system is certainly ill-prepared to handle that. And in industry, Japan shows most clearly a determination to dominate the world market in high temperature superconductivity. In contrast to the United States, 
Japanese corporations have more people engaged in more kinds of superconductivity research and development, all looking for their own commercial payoffs. Remember that 300 mile an hour floating train? It's made in Japan. Japanese railways plan to have them in operation within two years and hope to sell the trains to the U.S. And when even newer discoveries are made, the Japanese will be ready. Imagine, their assembly lines are actually in place now, committed to the products of the future so that Japan won't lose the future. It is very clear that if the technology evolves, the Japanese will develop it, implement it, and take all the profits from the product. So tonight, we've seen the tragic story of how America is losing the future. There are many culprits. Our schools don't have enough qualified teachers, and that means we don't graduate enough qualified students. Our industry has been reluctant to take risk. It's lost the edge in manufacturing. And we've let our system reward the management of money instead of the management of products. Our government has no tax policy to encourage long-term investment in research and development. We play merger mania instead. What's to be done? Plenty. But leadership must come from the top. President-elect Bush can make good on his pledge to improve education, make good on his pledge to place a high priority on science and technology. And the quickest way to do that is to create a single government agency with the money and the clout to coordinate a national technology policy. Our nation still has the opportunity to turn things around in HDTV, in superconductivity. But unless we do, we will be a nation risking second-class economic status. We will be the first generation in American history to leave our children a lower standard of living. We will be the generation which lost the future. I'm Sander Van Oker. Good night. We had such a lead on the rest of the world. We got fat, dumb, and happy. Over 12 million VCRs were imported. Our enemy is foreign competition. High technology is like an escalator. If your workforce doesn't understand the technology, then they're off the escalator. We can't make good cars. That's why we import we're cars. We're going to wind up the net importer of just about every major electronics product. The villain is the U.S. government. Congressional Budget Office. We can't make good scientists, so we import our scientists. We could learn from the Japanese. They learn our technology and mail us products that are better than the ones we, we can We have make. to educate a lot more engineers and scientists. American industry is the plaything of Wall Street. We're going to sell 100. They want their money in. Quick turn. The score is 7 to 3, with the United States being at the 3. We don't have a crisis. We have a disaster. If you wish a transcript, please send $4 to Losing the Future, Journal Graphics, 267 Broadway, New York, New York, 10007. This has been a presentation of ABC News, where more Americans get their news than from any other source.